guys, I'm Maria and I talk about America and its place in the world and why things are the way they are. So if you're back, thank you so much. Thank you. And if this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for joining. So I have a degree in political science and I thought that meant that I had a pretty solid idea like in my head of what our elected officials can and can't do. Lately, I've had to almost double check in my head whether the things that I thought the president could or couldn't do actually were things that they could or couldn't do because it seems like a lot of people, the president included, are kind of unsure and unclear about what the president can and can't do. So, hey, hi. <laughs> um, I'm essentially making this video to sort of clarify both to myself and to the like two people watching this what it is that the branches of our government can and cannot do and specifically what the executive branch and even more specifically the president is in charge of and isn't in charge of. I'm a big fan of always looking on the bright side of every situation so what I will say about our current situation um, entanglement is that we certainly have a lot of recent real-world examples to pull from when we talk about the power of the executive branch. So that's good. <laughs> but I have no interest at all in making this video about my opinion. I'm not going to be talking about what I think the president should or should not be doing. I'm going to be talking about what the president can and cannot do according to our constitution. <laughs> it's probably pretty likely that my biases will shine through not only in my tone um, and the despair in my eyes, but in the examples that I'm choosing to cover and talk about. But I just, yeah, I just wanted to right off the bat say it's not my intention to sit here and just preach. <laughs> um, I just want to give some information about a topic that I think can become really clouded now more than ever. The first thing that I want to talk about is the idea of a balance of power. The balance of power in the American political system is complex to discuss but really easy to describe for the most part so today I just want to focus on pretty quickly describing it so that we can get into the rest of the video. The American federal government is comprised of three branches. First is the judicial branch which is comprised of all of the federal courts of law and at the very top of these in terms of authority is the Supreme Court. So in a nutshell, um, this branch of government is in charge of determining whether laws are or are not constitutional. The way it works sort of at a high level is the Supreme Court is brought cases that have been tried and appealed both at the local and the state level. So as far as that case is concerned, the Supreme Court has the last word in determining whether the laws used by the plaintiff or the defendant in their cases are constitutional. And usually it's sort of one major question or one major norm that is being challenged. One really recent example of this was the Supreme Court ruling on LGBTQ plus workplace rights this year, 2020. Um, essentially, the Supreme Court ruled that LGBTQ plus people are supported under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, meaning that it, it is unlawful and unconstitutional for workplaces to discriminate against people on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Supreme Court rulings are super important because they have the power to set precedents that redefine our legal system for generations. I could go on forever and ever about the judicial branch because I think it's so fascinating. So if you'd want to learn a little bit more about them or just hear what I have to say about them for whatever that's worth, let me know because I could talk forever about it. But for the sake of the video, that's kind of where I'll I'll stop for now. So the second branch of our government is the legislative branch, which is comprised of the House of Representatives and the Senate, which together make up Congress. And it's important to remember that this branch, this branch is the branch that makes laws, that declares wars, and very importantly, that confirms or negates certain appointments made by the president to the judicial branch. But we'll get to that in just a second. Finally, we have the executive branch, AKA the president, the vice president, and the president's cabinet. The executive branch of government alone is very interesting, particularly when you take into account the president's cabinet and the role of the vice president, but 
For the sake of this video and the examples involved, I'm really going to be honing in on the duties of the president as an executive. The powers of the chief executive or the president are really interesting in that they are both massive and highly limited. For example, the president is the commander-in-chief of the military, but he or she does not get to declare war. Congress does. The president is the person who signs laws, but he or she cannot pass laws. And the president does have the power to veto laws, but this veto can then be overturned if two-thirds of Congress votes to overturn that veto. And, like we talked about a little bit before, the president does have the power to appoint both federal judges and Supreme Court justices, but these appointments need to be confirmed by Congress in order to be made official. So a very notorious and contentious example of this was when Congress did not approve President Obama's appointment of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. So the justification given by Congress for this was that we were nearing the end of Obama's term and that it would be more right if the American people could have a say and who was going to be appointed to, to the judicial branch by voting in the president who would then make that appointment rather than allowing Obama to make the appointment himself prior to his presidency ending. Though arguments certainly can be made for that rationale, it's very important to remember the partisan interests that were involved in this blockage of President Obama's appointment. It's important to note that the conservative-dominated Congress did have quite a partisan interest in preventing a liberal Supreme Court justice from coming into the court. We really can't talk about that example with out acknowledging the partisan motivations there, but that's a completely different video, so I'm gonna keep it rolling. So that's a really quick overview of the three branches of government, and I don't know if you can tell, but I'm really having to try not to go on and on and ramble. But now I do want to talk about the idea of a balance of power and whether power in our governmental systems really is balanced. So Although a balance of power exists in order to ensure that no one branch of government becomes too powerful, the system is imperfect for a variety of reasons. The first, and in my opinion, the biggest reason is polarization. Elected officials and the American people alike are becoming more and more attached to their identities as either Democrats or Republican. That really lends itself to the way that our elected officials behave and strategize. And that's to say that elected officials who are members of the same party are less likely to go against members of their same party, even if they have differing beliefs, whether it's morally, ethically, or just foundationally. In an increasingly polarized political environment, party Unity is very important to legislators who are parts of the Democratic and Republican parties. Maintaining the status quo and keeping the party intact often comes above individual concerns. And what that ends up meaning for the executive is that a Republican president, for example, with a Republican-controlled Congress, is far more likely to get laws passed than a Democratic president with a Republican-controlled Congress, or vice versa. Party cohesion trumps all. I can do a whole video, or even a whole series, on partisanship and polarization and the way these affect the way that our government is run and the way that politicians interact with each other and with the American people, but that's not what this video is about. So <laughs> the point is that even though the balance of power is very imperfect, it's there. And there are a lot of examples, even in very recent history, of that balance of power coming in pretty damn handy. Because of the balance of power, each branch of our government, for the most part, has essentially stayed in its lane over the course of American history, for the most part. I want to talk specifically about the executive branch, and even more specifically about the president. Over the years, I cannot tell you how many times I have heard variations of the same thing in people saying, oh, well, the president's just ornamental, he's a figurehead, he can't really do anything, it's all Congress, or why should I vote for the president? It doesn't really matter. Congress are the ones who get things done. And, you know, Congress has all the power. Who cares about the president? And the answer is you. <laughs> you should care about the president. <laughs> because even though the president's power is not unlimited, it is considerable. And let's talk about some of the ways that the president has considerable unilateral power. First off, 
yeah, the president is a figurehead. They're the figurehead. <laughs> they are the face of their party. He or she sets the tone for their party's stances on many issues. They have a huge impact on the extent to which their party is radicalized. They can have a major influence on the members of Congress who are part of their party and who do have a direct impact on which laws are and are not passed. And let's not forget, maybe most importantly of all, the president has a massive impact on the morale, the behaviors, the decorum, and the overall conversations had by the American people. Secondly, the president has the power to enact things called executive orders, which I'm sure a lot of us have heard about. It's important to note that executive orders are not laws, but they are a way that the president can get things done without having to rely on congressional approval. Putting it very, very simply, um, executive orders are essentially directives that the president signs telling a specific federal agency to do something, which is super vague, but I'll give an example in a second. So it's important to remember that executive orders may have similar effects to laws, but they are not ratified in the same way, they are not dependent on Congress in the same way, and they do not have the same long-term implications as real laws. And probably the most famous example in recent history is DACA. President Obama's DACA executive order basically granted temporary protections and temporary deferral of deportation to young immigrants who were brought to this country by their parents as children. DACA was passed sort of as a provisionary method while the DREAM Act was being debated and shut down and resurged for a long time. And while the DREAM Act would have been a law that provided young immigrants a direct pathway to citizenship permanently, DACA is not that. DACA is temporary. All it does is grant young immigrants temporary relief from the fear of deportation while giving them the right to work and drive in the United States for two years at a time. It's not permanent. Though executive orders have the potential to change hundreds of thousands if not millions of lives, they're not permanent solutions and they can be overturned by an incoming president. A third example of sort of unilateral power that the president has is to grant pardons to people who are convicted of federal crimes. One of the most popular examples of this was Trump's pardoning of Alice Marie Johnson, who was very famously championed by Kim Kardashian West. A much more controversial example of this was Trump's pardon of Roger Stone, who was convicted of having interfered with the investigation into Russia's interference with the 2016 election. So these are just a few of what I think are the most interesting examples of the fact that the president has a lot of power. The president is not just a figurehead. They can affect real change instantaneously sometimes. And that's not even considering what they can do when Congress has a majority of members who also belong to the same party as the president. So the moral of the story, vote. <laughs> it matters. Your one puny, tiny, single vote matters a lot because Millions of people in this country are wondering whether their single, tiny, puny vote matters. And even if a fraction of those people decide that their votes don't matter, that's millions of votes. That's enough to swing an election. None of us exists in a vacuum. None of us is alone in wondering whether we should get out there and vote. And the answer is that we should, because the tons of other people who are wondering whether their vote is important decide that it's not and don't vote. That's enough to decide elections. That's enough to determine outcomes for generations to come. And I, I don't mean to get all preachy. That's not what this channel is for. Um, I'm not here to use this platform as small as it is to push my beliefs onto people but I can't stress enough how objectively important and influential votes are. Even if the situation right now isn't ideal for you, remember that your vote matters. <laughs> I really encourage those who are watching who have the privilege to vote to exercise that privilege because there are so many people who are educated about what's going on and who would love to engage in politics in this country, people like dreamers who can't. 
So if you can, I, I just really strongly encourage you to do so. And contrary to what the president may have hinted at a few times now, an election is coming in November. One of the powers that the executive branch does not have is the power to delay or prevent elections from happening. I know that it's a really weird time, but another important thing to remember is that you do have options about how to vote. I'm gonna have a few links in the description about how you can register to vote and what your options for voting safely are. As you consider voting and hopefully consider it in tandem with the different powers of the branches of our government and the change that can be affected by your vote, you know, just remember that each branch of our government is important and each branch exists to sort of curb the power of the others, but it's undeniable that each branch is deeply connected to the other. Decisions we make for one branch can severely impact the decisions that are then made for others, and in turn, the effects that we feel and that vulnerable people in our country feel in everyday life. The president is just one part of the government, like the head is just one part of the body. Like, yeah, that's true, but it's a pretty important part. <laughs> So I promise this isn't going to be a preachy channel where I sit here and tell you what to do, but in thinking about the powers of the president and in thinking about what they can and cannot do, especially as we see certain statements being made that are confounding and confusing to us, I think it's great for us to think critically about the ways that the branches of our government interact with each other, and more importantly than anything, the power that the average everyday person has in helping to determine the ways that the branches of our government will continue to interact. Don't underestimate the impact that you and your friends and family can have in the world and in America's place in it. I know it's cringy, but I don't know, maybe I'm not completely jaded yet. Maybe I studied poli-sci for a reason after all. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Um, please be sure to like and subscribe and turn on post mode. But the, the, I'm really bad at this. Turn on post notifications if you want. I really, really would love to hear from you in the comments or in my Instagram DMs what you want me to talk about next. Um, this is always really fun. And the best part is hearing about what people want to hear about if that makes sense. Um, yeah, let me know what you thought of this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye!